Hello, staff students. This is Mrs. Limpy, and thank you very much for everything that you've done at home so far. I'm totally impressed by how you follow through on your work every now and then someone drops the ball a little bit for a day, but then they're right back in it. And I really appreciate that. Um, I think it's fantastic. I am in a, an online group of teachers who are trying to do distance learning um, teachers all across the country. And people will talk about, oh, wow, I had 40% of my students engaged today. And I'm like 40%. I mean, I had like 95. So um, I think you're doing a great job. I know this is not an ideal situation. So thank you very much for being um, good and for trying to learn regardless. So um, there were some questions. I asked you on the response form today to tell me if you had any questions. And so I'm going to try in this video to go through the questions that were asked. And just for clarification, tomorrow morning, which is March 31st, I am going to have some office hours during the time that your class would be meeting if we were to have a block day that was 2468. So during second period and during eighth period, time slot. I will be on Google Hangouts. Uh, the link is on Schoology. I'll send it again in a reminder um, shortly before each of those time slots. You can feel free to come to the other class period if you would prefer. Like if you're a morning person and you're in my eighth period and you'd rather come in the morning time and you're able to do that, you can feel free to do so. Um, and then April 2nd, which is Thursday of this week, we are going to take our unit three test in an online format. Um, another question that was asked, in the, I just thought it was really cute. Um, is the project still happening? Yes, the project is still happening. So you should be writing uh, your survey. We're going to, um, I have to figure out in the next few days how I'm going to have you do a peer review of those surveys. Um, if we were in class, I would just have everyone in the class look at everyone else's survey and offer comments in a, in a sort of formatted, regimented kind of way. Um, but I have to figure out how to do that. So that's on my to-do list. Um, soon, and then I think I'm going to have you guys re, um, well, I don't actually know this yet, so I think I'm not going to say. I'm going to have to modify this, obviously, a little bit because we can't hand out surveys at school like we were planning to. So um, I'm working on that next step, but eventually you will have a data set to work from and you'll be able to finish your project. Um, I do think I'm going to cancel the fourth project, though. So if you want to weigh in on that, like if you're like, oh, no, I wanted to do a fourth project. Projects are where I excel in the class. Um, definitely email me your thoughts. Um, or if you're like, yeah, that would be awesome. Please cancel the fourth project. Tell me that, too. I would love your feedback, and I'm open to consideration on that. Um, I was just lying in bed last night thinking about the fourth project, and I don't know. It just it seems like a lot. <laughs> Everything seems like a lot, doesn't it? OK, so let's look at the questions that were asked by you or your classmates. Um, so one thing that several people asked for is for me to just touch again on the different kinds of sampling. So I'm just going to briefly go through definition wise these um, six key ty types of sampling. So remember, sampling is when you have a whole population, you're interested in their opinions, beliefs, you know, habits, whatever, and you're going to take a subgroup of the population. So each of these types of sampling is a way to pick that subgroup. So the most straightforward, but also very basic way of sampling is what's called a simple random sample. So this is where you would do something like give every person in the population a number. So like number off. So if you imagine like our classroom, we have you know, 24 people in our class. So I say, hey, number off one to 24, and then everyone numbers off, everyone has a number. And then I have like a, a container that has slips of paper and the slips of paper are numbered one through 24. And then I would draw from the hat numbers. That's a simple random sample. Using your calculator to pick five numbers between one and 24, you know, using that random integer feature that's also doing a simple random sample. So you would have some, some way in which every person in the population or every plant or every animal, whatever it is that you're sampling, that every element from your population has an equal probability of being picked. That's the key part. Every element in population has same probability of being picked. Oh my gosh, I got ahead of myself in my writing. Sorry about that. Okay. 
stratified and cluster are the two that people get mixed up one with the other and I understand that completely. So stratified sampling is where you try to put, I'm going to draw a little stick people, is where you try to group people according to some trait. So maybe this is different neighborhoods that people live in, or maybe this is different grocery stores that they um, tend to favor, or whatever that grouping, whatever that attribute is, might be by age, might be by height, right? So you have some sort of groupings where the groups themselves have like a label to them. So like I said, all you people shop at Jewel, right? All of you people shop at Whole Foods, right? And then there's like groupings like that. And so that's what the colors here represent. And then in stratified sampling, you take each of those subgroups and you pick randomly. So using the idea of a simple random sample, but within this subgroup. So like this would be numbered one, two, and three, and I draw person one. This would be again, one, two, and three, and I draw a number from a hat. And this time I pick person three. And this, um, strata would be numbered off and I draw a number from the hat this time I, I draw one again okay and so I would pick some subgroup from each strata the strata are the groups that are similar in some way okay and then I would just have then a sample my sample then would be one person from the red group and one person from the blue group and one person from the green group and one person from the purple group and this would be my sample. And what's great about this sample is it has representation from each of the strata, right? So now I drew the strata, so there's only three and I picked one, but clearly like you could have hundreds of elements within each strata and then I could pick like 20 from each strata, right? Or something like that. So it wouldn't be the small scale. That's just so I didn't have to draw so much. Okay. Now in cluster sampling, it's like you have a, a bunch, like, let's say this is my population. And in this population, there's some groups that already pre-exist. So in my thinking about this, this would be like your neighborhoods. So right now you guys are all at your houses and you live in different neighborhoods. These neighborhoods, the people in them, aren't necessarily similar in any particular way. They just happen to live on the same block or the same street. Okay, so let's say that this is a neighborhood, we'll call it neighborhood A. This is a neighborhood, neighborhood B. This is a neighborhood, neighborhood C. And this is a neighborhood, neighborhood D. And then I could have many groups like this, like I could have A through Z, right? A through M, whatever. So I have all these different groupings. Now in these groupings, these people aren't necessarily alike. Like with stratified sampling, they are alike by some attribute. These are just people who are in little jumbled groups to start with. They already are all mixed up. And then, oh, let's say I had letters A through M, right? I'd put those in a hat and I'd draw a few. So let's say I drew A and I drew D. Now that would be what comprises my sample. Okay, so in this sample, I don't necessarily have representation the way that I do in the stratified, right? I was making sure I had a red representative, a blue representative, a green representative, et cetera. Here, I'm taking subgroups that already exist and I'm picking the whole group or the whole cluster. Okay, so I hope that that clarifies those two, one versus the other. They are hard to get your brain around. Okay, these I think are easier to get your mind around. Systematic sampling, you can always recognize. It'll say something like pick every fifth person, right? It doesn't have to be fifth. It could be every 10th, every 20th, every 100th, whatever. So it's, it's the process that is used like in manufacturing. Um, if you were at a, a manufacturer and they're um, making leather boots, then every 10th pair on the assembly line, they might pull that pair of boots off the assembly line and check these seams are strong and everything's good, right? Everything's being made correctly. Um, and that's called quality control. So that happens a lot in manufacturing. They don't necessarily inspect every single item, um, though some places do, like making a computer perhaps. Um, they don't necessarily inspect every single item, but they, they sample a subgroup of the things that they're manufacturing. And that subgroup is usually chosen just at intervals, okay? So it's like a set interval. 
All right, a voluntary response and a convenient sampling. Both of these are considered flawed ways of sampling. They both really invoke a lot of bias. However, that said, there are times when it is appropriate to use either one. In particular, voluntary response sampling is very appropriate to use um, in trying to get customers to share complaints. So the example I used in class when I lectured on this was the sticker on the back of a semi truck that says, how's my driving? No one is going to call and say, wow, the semi driver is doing such an awesome job. Okay, that's not gonna happen. The only time that anyone's gonna call is when someone is mad at the semi driver, driver because he or she just cut them off, right? Or they're swerving or they're just whatever, you know, driving 30 miles an hour on the interstate, being unsafe in some way. So how's my driving works perfectly because voluntary response which is what this is, it's asking you as to voluntarily choose to call in, take your time, go out of your way and participate. Um, voluntary response gets people who have strong opinions. And if you are the person who owns the trucking company, those are the exact opinions you want. You want the strong opinions. You don't wanna hear, oh, this guy is just totally doing his job. Right? That's not really of interest. You're going to assume that that's the case unless you hear a complaint. Okay, so voluntary response in how's my driving stickers works perfectly because it's evoking only strong um, responses. It doesn't, voluntary response doesn't work perfectly when it's like, hey, um, I'm a news program and I want you to call in and tell me your opinion. The only people who are going to call in are people who have really strong opinions. And so it's not representing the U.S. population as a whole. Yet, oftentimes, people will say, oh, well, this is what our view our viewers think. That's not necessarily true. It's what your most crazy viewers think um, at the extremes of whatever spectrum you're looking at. Um, so convenience sampling is what it sounds like. It's sampling in a way that is convenient. Sometimes I have stat students who try to do this in their project, um, which is not good, right? So convenient sampling is like turning to your friends and saying, oh, I have this stat project to do. Please fill out my survey. That's really not good sampling because now the people who are filling out your survey are the people who are your friends, right? Which is great, like your friends are nice. Of course, you have very nice friends, but, um, but it isn't representative of a population as a whole unless your population is my friends, okay? If your population is my friends and you're asking your friends, you're sampling perfectly. However, if your population is Lake Forest High School students and you're only asking your friends, that is not sampling perfectly. Okay, so convenient sampling is just asking people because it's a convenient group to ask, and that's going to have bias because you are not sampling across the whole population. Okay. All right, so types of bias. There are many, 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 like there are actually dozens of terms that label different kinds of bias, but these are the three that I expect you to know. If you happen to know some others because you're in AP psychology and you use those terms correctly, I know those other terms as well, and that's okay. You can use those other terms and I will understand you. But as far as testable material, these are the three that I am looking for you to know, okay? Under coverage is a issue in bias, and bias is something bad, right? Bias is something that flaws our data, makes things not represent the truth. Um, but under coverage is a kind of bias that comes about because of your sampling methodology. So this is you as a researcher messing up. So your sampling methodology causes a group to be missed. So a, a classic example when I took stats as a kid, as a kid, as a young adult, um, was you go to a corner where there's a church, right? There's a church at the corner. And on a Sunday morning, you stand out there and you um, survey people at that corner. Well, that's going to lead to under coverage of people who are not that religion, who don't go to church, right? You're missing out on a group of people. Another classic example would be um, standing at a gas station and surveying people who come to fill up their gas tank. Well, I'm missing out on people who don't drive, right? If I'm in the city of Chicago, there are many people who don't drive in the city of Chicago. They just use public transportation. So that would be a flawed method of sampling because I am missing part of the population. That is under coverage. I am not covering the people who I am missing under coverage. 
Okay, the two other words sound alike, and so I think they're confusing because of that. Um, I'm going to take response bias actually next, this one at the bottom. That one means lying, which means my response. This is, this is not an issue that you would have running the study. This is like you could set it up perfectly and you still could have response bias because maybe your survey topic is something about um, use of marijuana. And people don't feel comfortable being honest about if they've used marijuana or not. And so they lie in their answers. Okay, so that is what is called response bias. And so can you ever tell this for sure? Not exactly. There are some methods to try to like kind of tease that out. Um, there's a lab that we would do if we were meeting in person that where I kind of show you how people can get at that idea. Um, kind of too hard to explain, so I'm just going to let that go. Um, there are ways that researchers have to try to tell if people are lying, um, but you never really know for full on sure. However, you should suspect that if your questions are sensitive in nature, you can suspect that some things are going to be underreported, right? They're going to be rounded down, right? If you ask about, have you ever had a traffic ticket? People might feel ashamed about that. And so they might say no, even if the answer is yes. So a lot of times you just think like, hey, okay, it said 17 people, 17% 17 of people had a traffic ticket. Probably that's a low ball estimate, right? So you can take things like that into account. Um, Non-response is, again, not your fault as a researcher. Under coverage is your fault as the researcher if you have it. Um, but non-response is you might have sampled perfectly. You have this beautiful sample, like say you did this nice, you know, stratified sample. So you have all this like great representation of all the different groups, but then your your people who are in the blue group, they don't want to participate. They're like, no, I'm going to hang up on you, or no, I won't fill out this paper, or I'm going to just write stupid answers on your survey, right? That's non-response. So you chose well, but people refuse to do the study or do the survey. Yeah, you might have picked it perfectly, you might have made your sample perfect, but you're going to have a problem if too many people in your sample won't participate. Now you could be slipping into an issue where some groups aren't covered, right? You're slipping into under coverage because of non-response. All right, so someone asked me to discuss what block design is. Okay, so block design, it's sort, this is a little weird because sometimes I feel like it's hard to delineate when I'm talking about experimental design versus when I'm talking about sampling. So sampling has to do with, I want someone to take a survey, right? And so I, it, that's the idea. Um, I want a survey, I'm gonna find the people to do my survey and I sample to get those people and then I try to make them do my survey, okay? Experimental design has to do with imposing a treatment. So it might be that I'm developing a new allergy drug or I am developing um, a new like cream that you put on your back to help with back aches or whatever. I might have some new product that I need to test out and to test out that product, I need to do an experiment. Um, so that's the difference, right? It's, it's I'm imposing a treatment. I'm not just asking people what already exists. I'm doing something with these folks, right? And then seeing what occurs after that. So block design is sort of like stratified sampling, except we're now talking about experiments. So if I wanted to do some sort of an experiment and I thought it was important um, that age was an important factor in whatever it was I was testing, I might have age groups. I might say, okay, this is for um, kids, right? So 10 to 18 year olds, and then 18 to 24 year olds, and then 24 to 36 year olds, and then um, 36 to 50 year olds, and then people who are over 50. Okay, so I might have these uh, five age brackets, right? And then within those age brackets, I need to find, um, let's say 12 people. So I wanna have 12 in each group, et cetera, et cetera, and then these 12 people, I'm going to split them up and one of them is going to get treat or six of them are going to get treatment one and six of them are going to get treatment two. And the same thing within each of the other age groups. That's what's called block design. So block design, I have, instead of just saying, here are all the people who are in my study, here are the 60 people in my study, I'm going to make sure that those 60 people are grouped by whatever attribute I think is important, age, whatever. 
And then within those age groups, I will split up into treatment groups. Okay, and so I would only do this if I thought age was an important factor. If I didn't think age was an important factor, I wouldn't split up by it. I would just leave that like hodgepodgey, like all mixed together, right? If I thought some other attribute was important, I would separate by it. Okay, and with block design, you can actually separate out by multiple factors. And we'll actually talk about that in one of the questions someone asked about um, from the review sheet. Okay, there were three questions that were specifically called out. Um, it's something that we should look at. So 9, 10, and 12. So in question nine, um, I didn't even realize that this was here until I was actually posting the this worksheet. This is a worksheet I've used before. Can you believe how timely, right? Oh my goodness. Um, so here they're testing out a new vaccine. Um, they're testing it out on animals, as is often the case with medical research. And they have these eight rats that are named, and they want to have four of them be a control group, okay, to see like they are exposed to the virus, but they don't get the vaccine. And then the other four are going to be exposed to the virus, but they are going to get the vaccine. And then they're going to compare how the rats fare. So this is what's called a random numbers table. The first thing in using a random numbers table is to number every element in your population. That's already done for you. You have a population of eight rats. They are numbered one through eight. Then, because all of these numbers are single digit numbers, I will just read one digit at a time. If this population was large enough that, say, we had numbers like 12 and 42 and 17, then I would have to read two digits at a time. But it's only an eight rat population, so I only need to read one digit at a time. So if you read with me, the first digit is eight. That means that Polyphemus is going to be in my um, treatment group, okay? Because it's said to figure out who is in the treatment group. The next digit is a one. So Alfie is going to be in my treatment group. The next digit here is an eight. Well, polyphemus can't be in it more than once, right? That's not how medical studies work. So we ignore the eight. Then six. So Lyman is in the group. Again, eight. That is not helpful. We can't have the same rat in the group again. And then seven. So those four rats are the four rats that will be in my treatment group and they will receive the um, trial vaccine. And then the other four rats are going to be exposed to the virus but not get a vaccine. All right, this is very similar. Okay, so it said that out of my population of eight, here's my population of eight, they want me to pick three people. Okay, again, read from left to right. First number is eight. Second number is one. Third number is zero, but there is no person zero, so I just skip that. Then five, then seven. That would be my, oh, no, wait, sorry. There's only three. I forgot. The other question was four. This one was three. So then read up to five and then you're done because that's all it said. It said that our sample had to have three people. Okay, question uh, 12. Okay, this is a really good question. So it said, Jason wants to determine how age and gender are related to political party uh, preference. I think that's a great idea. Very interesting question. So he selects a random sample of 50 men in the 20, who are in their 20s. And he records some data about them. And then he records, he finds 60 women. And so already I have questions because why 50 and then 60? That makes no sense. And then those women are in their 40s. And so he's comparing these two groups. Now, the issue is he's mushed together two variables. He's smushed together gender and age, right? So he's looking at men in their 20s and women in their 40s. And that's it. So that's a really bad design. Um, so he cannot separate out those two variables. They're confounded in his data, right? They're mixed together. That's the word confounded, okay? So what would be better is if he had looked at men and women, and then let's say that there were like three different age groups, okay? So let's say you start voting at 18, and that goes to age 29, like, was, like one of his age groups is like 20 to 29. And then say he has the 30 to um, 49 year olds, and then he has the 50 plus. 
if he were to compare these six groups, now he has something. Because if he wants to isolate gender, he could take the same age group and see how the genders compare on that, right? He could do that all the way down the list. Right? So that would be a way to say, okay, similar age people, how do they compare? Right? And then he can look at similar gendered people, right? Like look at all of the men and then see how different age groupings work for political party. And he could look at all of the women and see how different age groupings work. So it would be a way to isolate and compare subgroups instead of just having this mush together mess that he has. This is just nuts. Okay, so I hope that this was helpful. I will be, as I mentioned, on a Google Hangout. I'm sending out the link again tomorrow, but it's in the Schoology folder uh, for today. And you can stop by at either time. You do not need to stay the whole time. Think of it as just like stopping in like you would, you know, for PLT or stopping by the math office to ask me a question. You can just come in, um, virtually come in to the Hangout and say, hey, I would like to look at this um, problem on the worksheet and we can do that together. Thank you so much and um, good luck with your studies and good luck hanging in there. Stay safe.